Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very honored, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't bring flying robots or uh, viral videos. Actually, I didn't even bring pictures, because I want to talk about the invisible. I want to talk about the global pandemic that's underway and how we can solve it together. Uh, it's a major health challenge, and yet no one's talking about it. It kills seven million people worldwide every year. It attacks our breath, our health. It undermines our well-being. It affects all of us, every single one of us. It's all around us. And yet, because we don't see it, we've largely chosen to ignore it. What I want to talk about today is air pollution. Think about this, breathing the air of our streets, of our cities, of our homes, has become a public health hazard. It actually is, as of 2014, this year, the world's first preventable health risk, according to research by the World Health Organization. It means that breathing is more dangerous than poor diet, uh, lack of exercise, high blood pressure, and tobacco itself. Now think about what this means for one second. More people die every year from breathing than smoking cigarettes. Right? And when's the last time you saw a label saying breathing kills hanging in the skies of our cities? Yet, breathing actually kills. Uh, one of the reasons we ignore it is we're actually not equal when we face air pollution. And uh, to borrow from the ancient Greek, right, Gnothi Safton, know thyself, tell me what you breathe, and I'll tell you who you are. There's a major environmental inequality in the way we breathe. And it's a source of inequality that feeds off social and economic inequalities, uh, because if you look at one single city, we think of pollution as something broad and general, but it turns out it varies a lot. It can vary by a factor of 1 to 10 from street corner to street corner inside the same city, and up to 100 or 1,000 in poorly ventilated areas indoor. Right? So it turns out that environmental inequality compounds the social and economic inequalities when we live close to big axes or when we're in poorly you know, lit or, or uh, ventilated areas. It turns out that's actually where we live. Those major axes where concentration is polluted is where people live because they need their cars and transports to get there. So in a city like Paris, where I come from, for instance, about half of the population lives less than 150 meters from a major, major roadway where there's lots of cars, lots of traffic, hence lots of air pollution. So social and economic inequalities, but also uh, urban inequalities and inequalities between cities. So all across Europe, for instance, uh, particulate matter, those fine pieces of dust, micrometer or 100 nanometers uh, pieces of dust that get into our bloodstream and can cause heart uh, failures, uh, they reduce the life expectancy of people in cities like London by three months of life. That's three months of life people living in London lose to air pollution. In Paris, it's six months. In Athens, it's a whole year. And in places, uh, the worst places in, in, in Europe, some cities reach nearly two years of life that is lost to air pollution. And that's only Europe. Because the main inequality today in air pollution is the north-south boundary. The gap between uh, Europe, where pollution is a problem, and the emerging world, where it's a huge challenge, is incredible. And as industries are booming, as, as populations in the emerging world are becoming part of this new emerging and rising middle class, of course, they're beating the records of air pollution year after year after year, and the megapolis in, in Africa, in India, in China are beating those records. And air pollution emissions are strongly linked to global issues, such as climate change. It turns out, actually, one of the main reasons we should cut climate change and carbon emissions 
is the health co-benefits of reducing those emissions. And there's a paper in Nature released this year that shows that if we cut carbon, we will save lives. So the health benefits of carbon policies actually outweigh their costs. So in a sense, the question of what we breathe is not really an environmental question. It's not about being green. It's not even about our health. It has become a geopolitical issue and a strategic uh, question. And I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Christopher Nolan's uh, Interstellar movie lately. A few hands. Well, then I'm sure you'll agree with me, right? That to a large extent, the future of mankind is in the air. So if we look at what we breathe, then we should have uh, optimism. This should be a good news. Uh, if our air is important, if it's our future, that should be good news because uh, our future has been incredibly bright for the past two centuries and a half. Believe it or not, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, humanity has made leaps and bounds in terms of progress. Uh, the health uh, system is incredibly better. We've saved millions of lives thanks to antibiotics. We've you know, wiped diseases off the face of the earth. Uh, the water we drink, it's a major challenge, but it's incomparably better uh, with the water system and the sanitation issue uh, that we had before the Industrial Revolution. Food itself certainly is a sh challenge, but the Green Revolution has put food on the table of billions, right? And yet the air we breathe, if anything, is worse than since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Why is that? Why is it actually becoming worse and worse and worse as the emerging worlds develop? This is not logical. Every day, we eat in about a kilogram of uh, food. We drink about two liters of water. That's two kilograms. A any guess on how much air we breathe in? It's going to be difficult. It's actually 10 times more we breathe in 20 kilograms of air. Every single one of us in this room breathes in 20 kilograms of air every day. And yet, the air we breathe has become worse. And compared to food, water, health, it has not improved. Why is that? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but we should actually breathe it. We should actually blame it on the Greeks. And specifically on a Greek mythological figure, uh, and that's Prometheus. Right, because Prometheus stole the fire from the gods, he brought it to mankind, uh, and in a way he brought us freedom with this fire. Uh, he brought us the lights that expanded our lives right, well into the night, allowed us to read, allowed us to expand our minds. He brought us the combustion engine, which shrunk the world to our size thanks to the car. It brought us the mechanical power that extended our arms' strength and made it possible for us to stop living out of the sweat of our brows. But for all his efforts, Prometheus had his liver eaten by eagles, you know the story, and uh, we ourselves had our lungs eaten by air pollutants. And that's the bad news here. Those uh, pollutants are the heart of human activity because nitrogen oxides are the heart of combustion engines. Those pollutants that attack our health and our, our lungs at high concentrations are the byproducts of the combustion engines. Their own byproducts through photochemistry, uh, the ground level ozone, not the good one, right? Not the uh, ozone that's in the ozone layer and, and protects us from UVs, but uh, the ground level ozone that triggers health crisis is also a byproduct of the transformation of nitrogen oxides through UV and photochemistry. Uh, particulate matter that we talked about is also a byproduct of combustion. And uh, if you look at hydrocarbons in a more general fashion, every piece of plastic, uh, every uh, industrial material that we touch uh, comes from hydrocarbons and releases harmful volatile organic compounds into the atmosphere and into our lungs. And so there's good news of progress over the past two centuries and a half, but there's bad news because air pollution is at the heart of human activity. And unfortunately, I would go further. Air pollution is at the heart of one of the major features of civilization. It's at the heart of our cities. Now, you may remember last year, uh, cities passed a quite significant uh, mark because half of humanity now lives in an urban fashion, inside those uh, cities and inside those mega cities that are developing around the world. 
how is that going to scale when, in about 15 years, will be about 65% of us living in urban conditions, in ever-growing megacities in Africa, in India, in China, where, because of the sprawling size uh, of those urban uh, territories, there are always more cars than are needed to cover always more distance and transport more goods from one way to another, which means always more air pollution emissions. Well, that's the bad news. But the good news about cities is they're as much part of the problem as they can be a part of the solution. Because what's great about cities is that they're platforms, right? New cities are platforms for new solutions. They're where the creative class has risen. They're where civilization here in Athens uh, has, uh, has, was born. They're a laboratory where innovators can you know, do away with the past and bring in new ideas, work on them, collaborate, like the drones we just saw, and bring new ideas into the future, solve the problems that we're facing. And most importantly, cities are where ideas go to scale. If you solve a thorny issue just like air pollution in one city across the world, if you find the right tools, the right combinations of policies and technology, then you can actually scale it all around the world. So cities have a chance to be infectious in a good way by spreading ideas and spreading solutions that work. And so that's why I'm actually very optimistic that in our, life, uh, in our lifetime, we have the tools and we can harness the solutions to solve this health crisis that air pollution, our very own environment, has become. So what sort of solutions can we harness? Well, of course, I'm a technologist. Uh, I'm, absolutely amazed by what we just saw, and I think that the convergence of, of all these technologies coming together, the bits, the atoms, the, the electrons, this great convergence is going to lead to a lot of new ways of doing things that will be part of the solution. Right? First of all, of course, there will be cleaner energy sources. Uh, so we can produce the same amount of energy by emitting less pollutants into the air, solving climate change while reducing the mortality from air pollution. But that's a very long-term prospect. It's going to be difficult. Yet, new technologies compound. New batteries technologies will help electric cars become a reality, right? Uh, that, in turn, will help create, thanks to uh, artificial intelligence and distributed systems, uh, to create autonomous transportation, which will be more efficient, taking some cars out of the road. We'll see the Internet of Things develop uh, and very much add sensors and intelligence to all of our industries, uh, to our lives, to the very fabric of our cities. And of course, the social infrastructure of, of sharing ideas, uh, sharing goods and sharing services means that with the collaborative economy and its rise, we will need less and less ownership of, of heavy-duty uh, transport uh, uh, tools such as, such as cars and less, less goods being shipped. So that, again, is good for air pollution. And yet, the solutions can't all be technological. They can't all come from science and from the development of, of, of new industries and technologies. The solution has to come from us, and we have to build it together. Because at the very heart of air pollution, there's a failure of collective action. There's a failure to balance the impact of what we're doing all together and what it means for each and every one of us who might get sick, who might, get, who might lose these, these years of lives that we see in the statistics. These are real humans behind the figures. And how do we solve problems of collective action. Well, that's what's actually interesting, because here in Athens, we invented not one, but two solutions to the problems of collective action. The first one, of course, is democracy. But the second one, you might not know it, but it was invented here. The first computer was invented in Athens. And I'm talking about, uh, of course, the uh, Antikythera mechanism, which you can see at the Archaeological Museum, uh, the first mechanical computer that was found on a shipwreck uh, off the coast of Peloponnesus, and which was a way that, in a way, was foreshadowing the entire emergence over the past few years of this new collective intelligent uh, mechanism through which computers, uh, networks, sensors are all meshed together and give us another uh, solution and another pillar on which we can build a more efficient, a, a more just, and a more equitable democracy. And so I want to talk about digital democracy as a solution to the problems we're facing, and specifically to air pollution. Why is that? Because digital democracy, in a way, reinforces those two core principles on which the solutions were built. One is that one man, one person should be one vote, 
of course, and the second one is that information should be shared for everyone. And that's because knowledge is power. So in a democracy, where power stems from the people and power is shared, information should be shared, data should be made accessible, and data of public uh, character should be shared with everyone. So what we need right now to solve the global issues we're facing is more open data. Now, it turns out over the past uh, nearly five years now, the better part of five years at least, I've been working hard to uh, help governments in, in France specifically, but also in, in Europe and uh, even further around the world, launch open data policies. And what this means is uh, they're taking all the data, all the information they're collecting from citizens, uh, from the environment, uh, from the health system in order to run public services, and they're making it open and accessible to everyone. Because by making data accessible, you're making the state transparent, and you're giving tools to innovators to build the kind of solutions we need. So open data is a tool for transparency, accountability, and innovation. It's been going pretty well. Things are picking up. Uh, there are more and more countries that are engaging in open government data policies. Uh, there's actually, a, a, right at the last uh, United Nations General Assembly, uh, I think more than 60 countries came together to be part of the open government partnership. So things are moving. But unfortunately, five years is way too long. It's personally frustrating, but it's frustrating for the world as well. This has been too slow. This movement has been too tame. We need to go faster. And most importantly, we need it to be a tool for change for those who can actually lead change today. And I'm talking again about cities. Because think about it for a moment. Cities are the ones running the public services that mean the most for most of us every day. The schools, the transportation systems, the air quality networks. And if cities can be open, then we can find solutions together. Sure, it's difficult. Certainly, it might be challenging. And yes, the fact that you would become more transparent is not something that's easy for an elected official. But yet, see it this way. Sparta didn't have walls, right? The legend is they had their own bodies. They did not need ramparts or walls around the city. Well, if you're strong enough, if you're confident in the strength of your democracy, you don't need walls in your government. You should be able to be open. You should be able to open your data to be fully transparent to your citizens and give them the tools to bring in the change we're trying to see. And that's specifically true of air data. Municipalities around the world are collecting data on the air that the citizens breathe. They're doing scientific measurements, but most of the time, they use it for themselves, and it's not open to the rest of the public. And so, as a way to solve this crisis, I was describing today. Uh, I want to use this moment to launch a call to mayors worldwide. Make your air transparent. Make it visible. Make your air data open. Make the collection of environmental measurements and pollutant concentrations you take in year in and year out in real time around those networks. Make it transparent and accessible to everyone. Let the conversation begin on environmental equality. Uh, let people use this data to build new solutions new ideas. Let us all be part of this collective solution, and let us clean the air we breathe thanks to the data you will open. So open your data, help make the visible invisible, and together, let's make our cities breathable again. Thank you very much.